Configuring Policies, and Citrix Connection Configuration. In the last section, we talked about how to configure our MetaFrame server, how to configure the setting, settings on the server itself. But what if we want to enable some configuration control on the client side? Well, that's done through what are called Citrix policies. It's, it's very similar to the, in the Microsoft space, uh, similar to group policies. And we're going to talk about that in this section. We're going to talk about what are Citrix policies. We're going we're gonna to create some policies. We're going to create a few policies and show you the process of creating them inside the CMC. For every policy that you create, you have to apply a filter to that policy, which says, where do I want that policy to apply? I also create a prioritization for that policy that says, if I have different policies configured for a particular client, which policies take priority? We're going to talk about that as well. And there's the concept of policy exemptions, and those are situations where I may want a policy to apply to a large number of users, but a certain few users may not get that policy. We'll talk about how to create those exemptions as well. In the second half of this section, we'll talk about Citrix connection configuration, and that is our ability to uh, configure the ICA protocol itself. We'll talk about the securing the protocol, will enable certain users or certain groups of users to perform certain items within the ICA protocol. We'll configure the settings of the protocol. And we'll show you what those settings are. We'll talk about session timeouts, the disconnection timeout, and the, the log off timeout, and uh, the log on timeout, and what those mean and how you can configure those as well. And we'll also talk about mapping overrides. And those are things like uh, enabling or disabling the client printers and, and client com ports, et cetera, from being able or from being mapped into the ICA stream. And at the conclusion of this, you'll learn how to enable or disable those from Citrix connection configuration. So here we are back at our presentation server. And to con configure policies, we open up the Citrix management console and we go to this node here called policies. As you'll see, I've already created a policy here called the audio policy. It says the description of this policy is that it configures client sound settings and the status is enabled. I've already configured this and I actually wrote this description here. If I right click on this policy and choose properties, I can see what this policy actually does. You'll notice here that there's an exclamation point, a bang, that's uh, configured next to client devices. If I hit the plus sign here and the plus sign next to resources and again next to audio, you'll see that I have enabled a policy on sound quality. This policy says I'm going to enable sound quality and I'm going to configure it for low sound quality, for best performance. That's an option that I can choose in addition to medium and high sound quality, but that's to say that for the users that are configured for this policy, I want them to have the lowest possible sound quality, yet the best performance. Now why would I want to do that? Let's say I have a, a set of users and these users are sitting at the far end of a very latent WAN connection. It's a very slow speed, and I want to make sure that they have the best user experience as possible. And so, in order to give them that best user experience as possible, I create a policy that says that for those users, I want to give them, you know, low, uh, very low sound quality, very low video quality. Um, I want to limit their capability for printing so that printing doesn't, doesn't consume uh, any of that excess bandwidth. Now, it's going to make the audio sound bad and it's going to make the video look bad, but at least it will have good performance for them. Let me create a new policy. Let's say under this example I want to create a new policy. If I right click on policies and choose the create policy link, I get an option for new policy. Let's say for this policy I want to configure their video settings so that their video settings are set to a very low video. In this situation, I'd create a policy name and call it video policy. And give it a description that says uh, video settings. We'll talk about these uh, connection types here in a second, but for, for, for this situation, let's just create a video policy and then let's right click on this video policy and choose properties. Since these are a set of individuals which may be over a low or a late, a low bandwidth or a latent connection, I want to reduce their visual effects so that I reduce the requirement for their bandwidth. I want to turn off the desktop wallpaper. Let me extend that a little bit. Let me turn off the desktop wallpaper by clicking Enabled. 
Let me turn off menu animations by enabling that as well. Let me turn off window contents while dragging. This is, if, as I drag the window around, does it show me the shadow of the window, the, 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 the outline of the window, or does it show me the actual window itself? So I'm turning off all these extra fancy features, if you will, in order to make it more, less bandwidth requirement for these users that are at a, in a, this faraway site. I'll click OK, and now the policy is complete. I've now created a new video policy, similar to the audio policy that I created before. Now your next question is going to be, how do I know who to assign this video policy to? I may have assigned this audio policy to some people, I want to assign this video policy to someone else. Well, if I right click on this video policy, you'll see I have this link for apply this policy to. Now, let's, let's look at a picture first that shows a little bit about the situation I'm trying to explain to you. Let's say I have my Citrix server here, and it's sitting on the 10001 network here. That's its IP address. And there may be a local machine here at 10002, and that's sitting on a high-speed network connecting to my Citrix box. But uh, across the WAN from this Citrix server is another series of machines on this 192.168 subnet. There may be a number of them out there. This, this local machine I really don't have a problem with. It's got a 100 megabit or maybe even a gigabit connection to the Citrix server, but these machines that are on the other side of the WAN, I want to make sure that they have um, more restrictive video and audio settings so that their user experience is still kept up. So how do I configure that? If I right-click on this video policy again and show you this apply this policy to, you see where I have the option to choose how this video policy applies via filter to uh, different situations. I can, I can filter it based on access control. It says, okay, uh, I want to apply to connections made, th made through MSAM version 4.0 or later. And that could be any connection or any connection that meets an MSAM filter. I can base it skipping across this next one to uh, based on client name. I could say, okay, the following client names can connect and get and apply and get this policy, or all client names get this policy. I can say, say the same thing about certain servers. I can say, okay, well, if the client is connecting to CTX Nugget 1, well, then they get the policy. But if they connect to CTX Nugget 2, they don't get the policy. So I would segregate out high, by, uh, high uh, uh, bandwidth connections from low bandwidth connections by server. Or I can say certain users get this policy, okay? Well, certain users in this Nugget Lab get this policy, certain users don't. In this situation, I want to say, well, based on client IP address, again, Looking back here to this diagram, we've got these, I, these hosts out here in this 192.168 net that we want to make sure that they get this more restrictive policy. So what I'll do is I'll filter this policy based on client IP addresses. I'll click the Add button and it'll say, give me a range. I'm going to start with 192.168.01, or excuse me, with 1, and apply that through 192.168.0254. So all of the hosts in that net and that network have the policy applied to them. You see I've done the same thing here in this audio policy. If I choose apply this policy too, I've done the same thing where 0 0.1 through 0 0.254 are applying the policy. Now, when we created that last policy, I, I said we're going to skip over this section. I want to go back to that. I want to right click on policies and choose create policy again. And you'll see down here that I have the option to initialize the initial policy settings for a connection type. Let's say for, for those users in that 192.168 net, I want to create a policy specific to their connection type. I'm going to call this WAN connection type. And I'll do the same thing for the description. You'll notice I have an option here to choose between a WAN connection type, a satellite connection type, or a dial-up connection type. This gives me, this will provide for me a, uh, a standardized set of policies that Citrix believes are appropriate for this type of connection. Now, this connection in our example is a WAN connection, so I'm going to choose WAN and choose OK. And then I'm going to choose properties on this WAN connection type. And you'll notice now that I have a number of exclamation points here. 
Next to printing, I have print job routing. It's enabled, and I'm always connecting indirectly as a client printer. Under client devices, Twain redirection is allowed, but uses lossy compression, compression, low compression. Under bandwidth, those visual effects that we talked about are disabled. This is what Citrix believes are good startup settings for a WAN connection type. Now, as you'll see, if I go back into properties of this, there are actually a number of different areas where I can configure properties for my clients. In fact, a large number of areas. And so, in configuring these, there is the possibility that I can create conflicts. I can create multiple policies where these policies are in conflict. And so, I need to have some way of saying this policy has more priority than that policy. And if these two policies are in conflict, which one overrides the other? You'll notice here that I have a priority column. This priority column says which policy is more important really than the other. The policy with the highest priority, and this is where it gets a little silly, the policy that is a higher ranked policy will override a lower ranked policy. Now, the weird part is, is that the number one is the highest ranked policy. So any policy with the number one is the highest ranked policy, and it's going to override anything below it. Anything that's set as number two will override anything below that, and on and on and on. Policies, in every case, always will override settings configured at the farm level or at the server level. So if I configure a policy, it's always going to override anything that I may configure somewhere else. However, there are two exceptions to that. The, the setting, whether it be at the, the farm level, the server level, or at the policy level, that sets the highest encryption level or the most restrictive shadow uh, policy, shadow configuration, will always win. And it doesn't matter if it comes from a policy or, or, or a setting over here on the left, whether it's uh, either one of those, the most restrictive shadow or the highest encryption settings will always win. And that's because we want to ensure that we always have the, the best encryption and the most secure shadow so that we're not looking over someone's shoulders when we don't need to be. I can change the priority on these policies by right-clicking on one. Let's say this video policy should have a higher priority than the audio. If I right-click on this, I can choose to raise or lower the priority on this video policy. I can either increase it or decrease it, or I can make it the highest or the lowest priority. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in my video policy and I want to make sure that it doesn't get overwritten. Well, I can choose to make that the highest priority and now it becomes number one. But as with every policy that you create, there's always a few users that, you know, they really just don't like what you've done. Let's, let's say I've created this video policy that makes things nice and smooth and, and nice and fast for my users at the other side of that WAN link, but I have two users, Bob Nugget and Jane Nugget. And they're, they're really annoying, actually. They, they want to make sure they have the best possible video. They don't care how fast it is. Well, in this situation, I want to create a policy exemption. I can actually do that by creating a brand new policy. Let's say I'm going to call it video policy exemption. And for this policy, I want to do the same thing as the video policy except in reverse. I want to take these visual effects because Bob and Jane just don't like the visual effects or they, they do like the visual effects and they want to make sure that they, they have all of these visual effects inside their client and I disable that policy inside of visual effects so that I'm not turning off these critical visual effects to Bob and Jane. I click OK and then Obviously, I need to move this policy's priority up and above the video policy, but I need to make sure that I apply this policy only to those very annoying users. I click the users here and filter based on users. I click here to show users. I look in my users OU and I see, well, there's Bob Nugget. And a little bit further down is Jane Nugget. And I want to allow those users to apply the exemption policy. You'll see here now that Bob and Jane will apply the video policy exemption, but everybody else will get the standard video policy. 
And that's really the gist of, uh, of Citrix policies. There are a lot of settings that you can set inside of Citrix policies, but for the most part, that's actually how you're going to create policies, set the priority for policies, and then create exemptions for those policies. Switching gears a little, I want to minimize the management console, the, the CMC here, and we want to talk about the Citrix connection configuration here. We locate it here on the, uh, the MetaFrame toolbar. Citrix connection configuration is another location where we're going to configure properties of our presentation server. However, here is where we're actually going to create or configure the properties of the protocol itself. You'll see here that I have two options by default, the ICA TCP connection name and the RDP TCP connection name. These are the default connection names when I install presentation server. As we talked about before, ICA is the protocol for Citrix and RDP is the protocol for terminal services. Going back to our list of items we want to discuss for this section, we want to talk about the Citrix configuration, uh, Citrix connection configuration protocol security and settings. We also want to talk about session timeouts and mapping overrides. Now, in here you'll see I have a security tab. If I select the connection name I'm interested in and choose the security tab, I can choose permissions for that protocol. And as you'll see here, I have a number of different objects inside of Active Directory that have permissions on that protocol. If I choose remote desktop users, these are the standard non-administrative users that are going to be logging into my Citrix box. And you'll see I can either offer them special permissions, guest access, user access, or full control. It's actually more useful for me to choose the advanced button, go back to remote desktop users, and choose edit. And you'll see now that I'm, it's broken apart into some more uh, uh, granular permissions that I can apply to remote desktop users. I can allow them to query information or set information. I can allow them to reset their sessions, shadow each other, log on and log off to a particular server. I can allow them um, to message each other and connect and disconnect. The most important of these is shadow. If you want to allow your users to shadow each other, you have to manually go in to the ICA TCP connection and enable the shadow right for your standard users. If you don't do this, then users will not be able to shadow each other. Only administrators will be able to shadow other people on the server. Do this if this is something you want to do uh, for your users. I can do the same thing on the RDP connection. It's the same set, uh, series of screens. I can enable uh, uh, users to shadow each other or enable users to have additional rights that they wouldn't normally have by default. But these are the security settings for these two protocols. For each protocol, I can double click the protocol to get more information about that protocol itself. I can, I can enter into comment for that protocol. I can, I can choose an adapter for which that protocol will route in and out of. By default, my adapter is selected for all adapters. I can allow either unlimited connections to this, uh, for this protocol or set a maximum connection count. I also have these three buttons here, which are very important. Under ICA settings, I can set the client audio quality. Notice here it's defaulted to medium. I can set that to high or low to provide more or less audio quality for users connecting in via ICA. If I choose the advanced button, I get the advanced connection settings for this protocol. Here on the upper left, I see logon. This allows me to enable logons for the ICA protocol. I could potentially disable logons for the RDP protocol so that users couldn't use terminal services to log in. I also have the ability to change timeout settings. There are three timeout settings here. The first is the connection timeout. This says how many minutes can my users actually remain connected into my Citrix server. This says under disconnection timeout, if my user's session becomes disconnected for some reason, how long will that session remain disconnected before it logs out or completely closes the session? The third one here says idle timeout settings, and that is how many minutes can a user be idle or not moving the mouse or touching the keyboard before the, the session becomes either disconnected or reset. For each of these, I can choose to either inherit the user connection timeout from the user object, which is in the Active Directory users and computers, or I can unselect them all, I can set no timeout whatsoever,
or I can set a particular number of minutes for each of these three timeouts. And in this example, this would say that my users could never be connected for more than 120 minutes. If for some reason they got disconnected, if they lost their connection to the system, that, they, that disconnection will remain for 10 minutes before the session would be reset or logged out. And a user has 30 minutes of idle time where they're not moving the mouse or touching the keyboard before their session uh, is disconnected. I'm going to skip past security for a minute, but you'll see these same inherit user config items down here. If I leave these to be the same, whatever is configured inside of the user object, inside Active Directory users and computers, will remain or will be the, the, the default for all connections to this, uh, to this server. If I unselect these, you'll see I get the option for choosing to disconnect or reset sessions that are broken or timed out. So what I talked about up here. If a session somehow gets disconnected from client to server, do I want to immediately drop the session or do I want to just disconnect it so that it could potentially be reconnected later? Do I want to allow reconnection for sessions connected from any client or from just this client only? And do I want to enable shadowing? And if so, do I want to enable shadowing such that the user who is shadowing can move the mouse and keyboard or not move the mouse and keyboard? And also, when a user that attempts to shadow someone else, does the shadow we get notified whether or not someone is attempting to connect to them? Moving back to this security, this sets my minimum required encryption for this connection. Do I want basic? Do I want RC5? 40-bit, 128-bit logon only, 40-bit, 56-bit, or 128-bit? This is the minimum connection security. And do I want to use default NT authentication for, the system, for uh, connections to this server? Up here in the upper right, you see auto logon settings. Typically, you want to, for these, inherit the client configuration. Otherwise, you would say, for every person that attempts to connect to this server, you're going to use the following username and password and domain. That's probably not a good setting if you want to be able to know which users are connecting to your server, but it's a possibility if you don't really care how users are coming in. Additionally, I can configure an initial program where, however, if I'm using Citrix, one of the benefits of using Citrix that we'll talk about in a future nugget is the ability to publish applications. So for the most part, I probably want to keep this set to inherit client and user config. This checkbox is very powerful, however, because this says that I'm only able to launch published applications. I cannot actually directly connect to a desktop on this server. If I want to further lock down my, pub, or my presentation server, I can select this checkbox to ensure that they only use the published applications that I set for them. Lastly, down here under user profile overrides, I can disable wallpaper. This is always a really good idea to do because unless your users have a need for a particular type of wallpaper that they can modify, this says anytime a user connects to this server via ICA, just disable the wallpaper that will free up excess uh, bandwidth that may be unnecessary. Clicking on the client settings button, I have the option to, as before, inherit the user object configuration, or I can unselect this and choose to either connect client drives at login, I can click connect client printers at login, and I can default to the main client printer. I also have the option to choose overrides. I can say, okay, Globally, for any user that is connecting to this server over the ICA protocol, disable their client drive mappings. Disable their client printer mappings, or LPT, or COM ports, or their clipboard, or audio mapping. This prevents those client resources from connecting in through the server. This also reduces the bandwidth signature, but may provide or, or may eliminate necessary connectivity for the client. This first one, for example, prevents the client from being able to map their local drives into the ICA session. And I may want them to be able to download files off of my Citrix server onto their local desktop. So be wary when you, con when you configure these that they may di uh, disable certain uh, functionality that your users may want. Same thing down here. By default, connect only to the client's main printer and I can choose a maximum total color depth in bits for 
um, how I want those users to be able to connect to my server. Do I want 8 bit or, or 16 color, 15 bit, 256 color, uh, high color, or true color? A lot of times, whenever you find problems troubleshooting a, a Citrix server that has problems connecting to client resources, it's because these checkboxes are selected inappropriately. So just be aware of this configuration when you're troubleshooting your Citrix server. We talked about that inherit user config. So let me show you if I, if I bring up Active Directory users and computers. And let's say I look back at Jane Nugget, that annoying user we were talking about before. And I view properties for her. You'll see a number of issue, uh, instances in here under different tabs that talk about the terminal services startup environment, for example. Here you see these connect client drives at logons, client printers at logon. These are the same checkboxes we saw back in the ICA protocol configuration. Same thing with sessions, ending disconnected sessions, setting active timeout limits, uh, whether I want to disconnect or reset the session. This is the area where I talked about, where we talked about that had to do with inherent user config. Now you can see an issue here where if I allowed the inherent user config for each user, I would have to go in and configure that user's properties. That's why the uh, connection configuration is there because that's kind of a mess to go to into, into each individual user and, and set those properties. So it's probably a good idea, unless you have specific user requirements, to disable the user configuration and set it on a per server basis. So that's Citrix connection configuration. In this section, we talked about policies and Citrix connection configuration. We talked about what are policies and what do they do and how are they used. We created a few policies and we used those created policies. We, we added filtering to them and we, we showed how to prioritize those policies so that the correct users got the correct policies. We also created an exemption for those two users, uh, Bob and Jane, that really wanted their video settings set the proper way. So we saw, talked about how to create exceptions and to invert the settings in those policies for those exceptions. In Citrix connection configuration, we talked about the protocol security and how to apply and deny um, additional rights for particular users to the ICA or the RDP protocol. We showed where the settings were set for those protocols, including session timeouts and mapping overrides. And we also showed inside of the user object where we could also set those settings. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.